that. In my talk, I will focus on two things. First, I will do a kind of an archaeology of the spoiler phenomenon and uh, try to track down when, when did this modern spoiler, as we know it, come into existence, how and why. And then the second part, I will look at specific at the question, what, what stories can actually be spoiled? What kind of narrative structures can actually be spoiled? And since I'm a film scholar by training, I will mainly look at film. So let's start with this Peanuts cartoon, which is from 1973. Uh, and what we can see two things here. One is that it has always been possible, of course, to tell in advance how a story ends. But I'm pretty sure when Charles Schulz grew this cartoon uh, almost 50 years ago, he wasn't thinking of spoilers because the term didn't exist, the concept as such didn't exist. And just a remark on the side, I'm actually not really sure whether you can really spoil Citizen Kane, whether a rosebud is really a spoiler, whether that's not uh, more kind of MacGuffin, which is not really important uh, for the plot. Wells himself famously uh, disparagingly called it a gimmick and a dollar book Freud, so maybe it's actually not that important. But uh, still, um, uh, what we can say is it, it was already possible. And this is also an argument put forward by Richard, Gre Richard Green in what, I, what, to my knowledge, is the only book-length study on spoilers. Green says that while it has always been uh, possible to divulge the end of the story in advance, uh, as a discrete concept, the spoiler is rather young. And if we try to find the beginning, basically everyone who has looked into it arrives at the same conclusion. The first use, usage of spoiler in the sense we understand it today was in 1971 in the April issue of the magazine National Lampoon. National Lampoon is a US magazine, a satiric magazine in the tradition of Mad Magazine and similar publications. And there, there was a, a three page article uh, um, with the big headline spoilers. You can see it here. And here, quote from the beginning In more tranquil times, Americans laughed nothing better than curling up with a blood chilling whodunit or trooping off to the cinema to feast on spine tingling thrillers weird science fiction tales and hair-raising war adventure. Nowadays, however, if the country has seething cauldron of racial, political, and moral conflict, the average American has more excitement uh, in his daily life than he can healthily handle. This uh, sounds uh, eerily topical, uh, but uh, let's uh, ignore that for a moment. So it goes on. For this reason, on the following pages, the National Lampoon presents as a public service a selection of spoilers guaranteed to reduce the risk of unsettling and possibly dangerous suspense. So the humoristic conceit here is in order to reduce tension, um, here are now uh, many spoilers for not only for films, but also for novels. And here you can see uh, all kinds of uh, different kinds of media of literature, of films, uh, and uh, I made some of those bigger so you can, can read them. There is basically the classic example, which will uh, come up uh, several times uh, uh, during this conference, I'm sure, Psycho by Alfred Hitchcock. Um, again, we have Citizen Kane here, uh, but we have also some examples which I think are rather strange. I'm not really sure that you can uh, spoil Hermann Hesse, for example, and especially strange, Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. Here, the spoiler, Raskolnikov did it, is of course no spoiler at all. That's the whole premise uh, of the novel. Uh, it starts with Raskolnikov killing off the old lady. So I don't know whether that's really counts as a spoiler. But this is the first example where spoiler is used in the modern sense. I don't really know what happened in the following years and how, when this, uh, term was picked up by, whether it was picked up by whom, but what we do know is 
the first time the phrase spoiler alert was used. And that was in June 1982. And it happened in an online discussion, in a UCNet discussion. Those among you who are a bit older might still remember the days when there weren't any browsers, when discussions online took place in Usenet discussions. And here that's June 8, 1982, in the newsgroup news net.movies on the subject of the second Star Trek movie. Uh, uh, here you have the first use of the term spoiler alert. And I would argue, and I will come back to this later, that it's no coincidence first that this happens in online communication and second that it is about a science fiction movie. I, um, that's really something which is no coincidence. Um, in the following years, spoiler and spoiler alert becomes an integral part of online communication. Here, just as an illustration, um, that's from a book from 1997, Cyberspeak and Online Dictionary. So that's a book about um, how you uh, speak or write uh, online. And here we have a, an entry for spoiler. And it says, in a public or private message about a movie or a book or any other suspenseful creation, the word spoiler in either the subject or the body of the message indicates that the message contains info that would spoil the ending for people who haven't yet seen the film. An almost mandatory practice of online etiquette. The spoiler warning is so widely used that many newsreaders can detect a special spoiler character, control L, which causes it to scroll down an entire screen before this playing the next line. And here, just as an illustration, I actually had quite a hard time to find this because all modern uh, news uh, uh, use net readers uh, don't have this uh, function anymore. You see here, there's a special menu, menu item for inserting a spoiler character. So at that time, spoiler, spoiler alerts are already an integral part of online communication. But we have to uh, realize that we are at that time, we are talking really about a niche. This is a very specific, rather small group of people who in the mid nineties communicate by Usenet uh, and other means. And that's definitely not the majority. So the term spoiler has not yet en entered the mainstream. To find out when it actually entered the mainstream, I looked at Google Ngram. For those of you who don't know, uh, Google has digitized millions and millions of books. And with Google Ngram, you can track uh, how often a certain term appears in their corpus. And here we have a cur the curve for spoiler alert, which I will say is very uh, distinct. As a side note, I specifically uh, search for spoiler alert because if you do the same search for spoiler, you get a very different result, um, but um, most of the time uh, you will get results which do not, uh, where spoiler is not used in the meaning we are interested in. Uh, most results will then be about aerodynamics, about planes and cars and stuff, and not uh, about uh, fiction. And it's not possible with Engram to say, uh, look for spoiler, but uh, exclude fiction and stuff. But what you can see here, I think it's very clear by the uh, end of the 90s, it gets mo uh, uh, more widely used. And then uh, by the mid uh, of, of the noughties, there's a dramatic increase. So at that time, um, about the beginning of the millennium, a bit later, it enters the mainstream. To confirm this, I also looked at the archive of the New York Times as like an example of one of the mainstream newspapers. And there you can see that the earliest example I could find in New York Times are from 2002, but there are only very few. And then here, an, a, an example, which I think is quite interesting from 2004, an article by Emily Nussbaum. Um, here, uh, she talks about the end of the surprise ending. And uh, when she talks about spoiler, she still for the first time when she uses it, she still puts the term in quotes to indicate that obviously at that time, she cannot be sure that her readers will actually, actually know that term. She still has to introduce the term because it's new at that time. 
there's also an interesting uh, comment here. Uh, she says, but with, with ever more behind the scenes information floating around in gossip columns, online discussion boards, and mainstream publications, it has now become entirely possible to find out what happens to favorite characters month in advance. This leakage is fundament fundamentally altering the nature of episodic TV. Keep that uh, last sentence uh, in mind. And I've also interesting, I think, is the subtitle where she talks about the too much information age, which I think is actually a quite an apt term because uh, if we want to explain how is this, how did the modern uh, spoiler come into being, or rather the fear of the modern spoiler, I think there are two uh, aspects which are important. One is, as we've seen, spoiler, spoiler alerts, they arise, they appear for the first time in online communication. And I would suggest that online communication is essential for spoilers as we know them today. Again, it has always been possible to tell in advance how a film or a novel ends, but uh, in pre-internet times, uh, when you would, for example, at work during a coffee break, and you would tell someone, oh, I watched this movie yesterday and uh, incredible how it turned out. One, on the one hand, you would only talk to a very small group of people. I don't know, three, four or five people or something like that. And if they were, didn't want to listen to that, they could tell you or they could just walk away. With online media, of course, and especially with social media, with Twitter and Facebook, you reach a potentially huge audience immediately. Uh, you can instantaneously um, address uh, thousands of people, depending, of course, how, how many followers you have. And what is also important, um, the information is broken down into very small bits. In a traditional print newspaper, you can always skip a film review, for example. You can just uh, turn on the page and go to the next article. That's basically impossible, for example, with a tweet. A tweet is so short, once you looked at it, you, you've read it, uh, you can't really skip or unread a tweet. So the communication system is completely different and this makes spoiling in the way we understand it today um, possible. On the other hand, there's also a big change in storytelling. And here I'm uh, talking especially about films or mainly about films because there is, uh, towards the end of the 90s, a constant trend to more complex plots, to more complex uh, screenplays. If you look at classical Hollywood, and this is a big uh, overgeneralization, and I'm sure there are big, uh, I know there are hundreds of counterexamples, but still in the traditional Hollywood movie, there is not really that much to spoil. Here are just three examples. For example, in a romantic comedy like Bringing Up Baby, we know how this uh, film will end. Of course, he uh, Catherine Hepburn and Cary Grant um, will be together in the end. There's nothing to spoil. The same is true for the classic Western. We know in the end, the good guy will shoot down the bad guy. We actually even see that here on the poster. And the only real question is, will the good guy in the end uh, right away into the sunset, or will he stay uh, in the village and marry the woman he loves? And the same uh, for an action adventure uh, like uh, Goldfinger, <coughs> we know how a James Bond movie ends. There's really nothing much uh, to spoil here. We know that James Bond can't die, or rather couldn't die until very recently. Um, so that's not really a change. This said, of course, there have always been uh, movies with surprises, there have always been movies with twists. Wow, what an ending! Who'd have thought Darth Vader was Luke Skywalker's father? Ah, oh, thank you! Oh, thank you, Mr. Blow the Picture for me! So, uh, that would be an example of a movie which uh, you could spoil, uh, so that's from uh, Empire Strike Back in the 1980s. And of course, there have, before also that there were movies which could be spoiled, but still twists were more or less the exception. 
uh, you most of the time you knew how things would turn out. This changes dramatically in the 1990s. In the 1990s, we get, and here just a few examples, we get a host of movies with all kinds of twists where things are not the way they are. And in the end, we realize everything was different. Actually, uh, we, it's a completely different world than we thought. Um, and you have everything gets reconceptualized. This subject has been researched quite extensively in film studies. And as you can see here from the various terms, uh, which are here on this slide, there are also, there is also, the nomenclature is not uniform. And there are, some people talk about puzzle films, some about um, uh, modular narratives, mind games films, and so on. These terms not always mean the same thing. Uh, there is some overlap and they, not all authors talk about exactly the same movies, but you can more or less group them together and say something changes by the mid and nineties. Um, I also included here Twin Peaks, which is from 1990 and 91, so the first series. Uh, also that's a bit earlier. I included it because I would argue that Twin Peaks was in the long run, extremely influential. And basically we wouldn't have today's uh, TV series if it wasn't for Twin Peaks. So, but uh, from now on, when I talk about this phenomenon, I will use as an umbrella term, I will talk about complex narrations. As I said, there is toward the end of the 1990s, a significant shift we see much more complex narratives. More and more films and series are produced with non-classical narrative structures and a strong emphasis on twist and unexpected terms. And this is of course highly relevant for our subject because suddenly there are much more films which can actually be spoiled be because there is a twist, there's actually something to spoil. So, uh, um, now the question is uh, how, um, why did these complex narrations arise at that time? And this is also something which has already been discussed uh, quite uh, or researched quite thoroughly. And the general consensus is that this is related to new means of distribution and reception. In the classic setup, you would go to the cinema and watch a movie and then wait several years at, until you could watch it on TV. Of course, it was always possible to go to the cinema several times, but that was certainly not the norm. And of course, there are also reruns on TV, but still, in general, you wouldn't watch a movie that often. And even uh, maybe even more important when it comes to movies, uh, or when it comes to, to TV, sorry, um, you would watch most of the stuff uh, at the same time. If there was this, mystery thriller uh, on TV or this mystery series, everyone would watch it, I don't know, on Sunday evening. So everyone was uh, uh, on the same page. This changes um, with the introduction of new ways of distribution and reception. First, but that was not that, that significant with VHS, then much more significant with DVD, and of course, uh, especially with DVRs uh, and, and now today with streaming services. Now we can watch films and um, rewatch them endlessly. Uh, we can watch them as often as we want and probably even more important, uh, thanks to uh, means like streaming services, but also DVRs, uh, we are, everyone is now on a different schedule. And this is especially important when it comes to TV series. There are C uh, TV series which are still uh, aired a weekly, so you have to wait a week, but there are many people who say, no, I will wait until the end of the season and then binge the whole season. There, uh, there are, depending on which streaming service you are, there's also could be, there can be delays. Uh, when is what uh, the show available? Um, some people watch it immediately. And uh, when I watch it, uh, I don't know, in Europe, uh, I will not probably watch it at a different Although it's released simultaneously worldwide, I would watch it in Europe probably later because I'm on, in a different time zone and so on. So suddenly we have all kinds of different schedules, which is important for streaming because suddenly everyone is uh, on a different level. No, we cannot be sure that everyone has watched the same thing at the same time. 
Another important uh, aspect is that with online media, we have now new uh, venues for discussion. We've already seen that uh, with the news group discussion, uh, and uh, it's uh, actually uh, quite interesting. Um, the, fir the first academic scholarly article I'm aware of, which talks about spoiler alerts. Um, there could be an example, I don't know, but the, the earliest I know is from 1995, and it's by Henry Jenkins. Uh, and there he talks about spoiler alerts in discussions, in news group discussions on Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks is generally regarded as the first show which was extensively discussed uh, online in Usenet discussions. At that time, no one really thought about that. That just happened because people were enthusiastic about it. Nowadays, the whole uh, online fan culture, the whole of these discussions there are um, already an integral part of the whole marketing and distribution of the series. The, the producers, they count on a uh, fan base which will discuss uh, uh, this stuff. And probably the first TV series which really made use of this extensively and really right from the very beginning was counting on an online fandom was Lost, uh, which started in 2004. But compared to today, uh, Lost is, uh, uh, is also uh, ancient history. Uh, everything is now discussed online and I'm sure you've all done this before. You watched the movie and then you thought, okay, I didn't really understand the line that character was saying at that point and how exactly the twist happened, what was going on there. And then you go to Google and half a minute later, you are uh, in an online forum where exactly this question has been analyzed and discussed in great detail. So uh, everything is now discussed online. There's this saying that with the internet, no one is alone anymore. And this is especially true when it comes to this kind of online fandom. Again, uh, in pre-internet times, it was probably quite hard to, if you were um, a really a hardcore fan of a TV show, it was probably quite hard to get in touch with like-minded people. Today, thanks to online media, it's extremely easy. The filmmakers, they are aware of that. I already mentioned the example of Lost. And since they know that films and uh, series can be rewatched endlessly that they will be discussed, they also take this into account and make their stories more and more complex. And so we get a, a kind of circle. We have new means of distribution and reception. They uh, allow for multiple viewings. This leads to more complex narratives and these complex narratives, they uh, lead to an increased need for discussion. And so we are again uh, back uh, at the uh, uh, changed uh, ways of distribution and reception and online discussion. And there's a kind of circle, I'm not really sure, I'm not really sure whether to call it the vicious circle, but um, what we can say is that com complex narration and spoilers, they feed into each other, or rather the fear of spoilers, they feed into each other I think it's, you can't really say that this was first and this came later. It's really something which uh, the two things are just uh, um, uh, interrelated and reinforce each other. This has all, this has impact uh, on many levels and one level which also um, concerns me since I also work as a freelance film reviewer is film reviews. When I started out as a reviewer some 20 odd years ago, spoilers weren't an issue. And I remember quite well the first time, I can't exactly date it, but I remember, remember the first time when for the, uh, in the invitation of a press screening, there was a non-disclosure agreement included. So as a reviewer, you had to promise and you had to sign this that you wouldn't um, release any information on the film before a, a certain date. When that happened for the first time, my reaction was, okay, now these majors have gone completely crazy. They are absolutely nuts. This will not stand. Today, this is normal. We, are, uh, we, we do not wonder uh, uh, we anymore. We're not surprised at this anymore. It's really for major blockbusters, is, it is standard operating procedure. And at least for me, uh, the pinnacle 
uh, somehow was reached with uh, Blade Runner 2049, which was released in uh, 2017. There, um, in the cinema, we were shown a letter by director Denis Villeneuve. Whether it was really a letter by him, I don't know. But in that letter, we were asked as film reviewers not to divulge um, the following uh, elements of the plot. Uh, and then there was a list. Unfortunately, I didn't take a picture there, but after um, with a bit of Googling, I came up with this. I, it's not the exact same letter, if I remember correctly, which we had uh, at our press screening in Zurich, but still, uh, it is a very similar. The interesting thing is that the guy who posted this on Twitter thought it was necessary to actually black out the important elements. So um, all of you who know the movie, they can maybe uh, figure out uh, what is under the black parts. But uh, this is really, I, I think uh, there it reached a, a certain peak. And this went on also in the whole marketing campaign and press campaign for the movie because the actors were basically not allowed to say anything at all about the, the, the movie. Here is from an interview with two of the female stars with Anna de Armas and Sylvia Hoax uh, on Blade Runner 2049. <laughs> well, what are you allowed to tell us? Because there's so much secrecy around it. What are you allowed to tell it's us? It's a reason. <laughs> it's a reason. <laughs> Like yeah, oh my god, I always feel like there's something gonna come out and then... <laughs> it's such a big secret, I always feel kind of talking philosophically about it is the best way. Like, you know, for me it's really about broken dreams, about humanity, what, what does it mean to be human, um, yeah, these big... Yeah, I think it's a movie, of, you know, all the characters in the movie are searching for their identity and something real to connect to, something to hold on to and that gives sense to their existence and they're kind of lost and in a way, so. Well, you've given me nothing. <laughs> <laughs> this the short interview is quite typical. If you search for interviews with uh, the male stars, Ryan Gosling and Harrison Ford, you will end up with 10 minutes uh, talks where they say absolutely nothing because it's really hard to talk about the movie if you're not allowed to talk about the plot or the characters or anything. Uh, and so it, it's really a very, absurd a situation which we are in now. Um, Sebastian Smolinski, he will talk about uh, film reviews and spoilers uh, in panel two uh, today. Uh, so we will certainly dis uh, discuss this in more detail and it will also be a prominent subject uh, in the round table discussion which takes place this evening. So we will hear more about uh, this issue. So now I want to look at the question, what stories can actually be spoiled? Um, what are we? What is it that we are, are afraid of, or some people are afraid of, but can actually be spoiled? Judy Rosenbaum in her key, keynote tomorrow will talk about uh, the empirical side and uh, talk about uh, what where the spoilers actually do spoil the experience. Uh, she, uh, as an empirical psychologist, uh, has done interesting studies on, on this subject, but I want to look at it more of obviously, uh, since I'm not uh, um, doing empirical research, I'm looking more on the point of view from the text uh, or the film. And to start this, I wanna go uh, back, uh, uh, I wanna turn to literature for a moment and go back uh, several hundred years to one of the big classics, uh, William Shakespeare's Hamlet. Uh, literature, by the way, uh, will also be uh, the subject uh, of uh, James Aaron Green's talk in panel one, um, uh, which is after uh, this talk, and also Dana Steglich, uh, she will also talk about the uh, spoilers in high literature. So it, this is the title page of the second quarto from 1605, and what can we see here? Uh, we already have here a very clear indication, it is Hamlet is marked as a tragical history or a tragedy. And if we know anything about tragedy or tragical history, we know one thing, how this will end. We know that Hamlet will die. That's more or less the defining characteristics of a tragedy. So there's nothing to spoil here. Uh, th there is um, a whole genre and it's not the only genre where 
just because we know uh, what the genre is, we know how things will turn out. So what we can say here is that there are obviously, uh, I don't know uh, the, uh, about his percentages, but there are whole, at least whole genres where when it comes to the ending, you can't really spoil them. And if we leave the question of genres uh, at the side for a moment, but still uh, remain with Shakespeare, let's look at another famous play by, Shakespeare, by William Shakespeare. Let's look at Romeo and Juliet. Let's look at the prologue of Romeo and Juliet. And here in the version uh, by Baz Luhrmann. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end naught could remove is now the two hours traffic of our stage. Two households, both alike in dignity in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. So we are half a minute into the play or the movie, and if there's one thing for certain, it is that the two main characters will not survive the play. We know that from the very beginning, and obviously Shakespeare thought it wasn't important that people would know it or that it wasn't really a problem. And for uh, more than four centuries, audience also thought that it uh, is the problem that we know right from the beginning how this story ends. So you could maybe argue that somewhere in the back of our mind, there is always a dim hope that this time they will survive, that they won't die, but we know that they will die. So um, there is, again, there are group of texts and probably not a, a small group, which at least when it comes to the ending cannot really be spoiled. But I've, um, when it comes to spoilers, it's all, um, often the basic argument is yeah, with a spoiler, there, Spoilers destroy suspense. If we know how things will turn out, uh, there is no suspense. And that's why I want to now look at suspense a bit more in, in a bit more detail. We will have uh, Albrecht Koschortes keynote tomorrow, which focuses on suspense. And I'm sure uh, he will say much smarter things than me about suspense. But uh, I look at it mainly from a point of view of film, and he looks at the literature, so I don't think it's a problem if I also accord this. If we talk about suspense in relation to film, there is, of course, one person we always have to go to, and that's the master of suspense, that's uh, Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, here is from the famous interview Francois Truffaut did with Hitchcock, uh, Hitchcock's definition of suspense, which I'm sure many of you, of you are aware of. The, I'm now playing the original uh, audio recording of the interview, and just as an explanation, Truffaut didn't speak English, Hitchcock didn't understand French, so they were always communicating with a translator. And I tried to edit the translator out, and I also trimmed this passage a bit, but there are certain overlaps, so you hear the translator at several moments, but I think it's still, uh, uh, I think you understand it quite well. So what does the master of suspense say about uh, spoilers? You know, there's always been this dispute between suspense and surprise. There might be a bomb under this table and we are having a very innocuous conversation. Nothing, you know. 
but suddenly, boom, this thing goes up. The audience are shocked. It has been very, very dull up until the time that the bomb goes off. The shock will last. 15 seconds and it will ease off a minute, two minutes and that's that. Now we go to the other version. The bomb is under the table and the audience are shown that it is there. They have been told probably by uh, uh, the anarchist that it's time to go off at one o'clock. There's the clock and it's quarter to one. The conversation which was so dull now becomes exciting because the audience are saying, don't talk such frivolous things. There's a bomb under the table. This we play. Instead of 15 seconds of surprise, we can have 15 minutes of suspense. Which brings me to the point about providing the audience with information whenever you can, unless your surprise is a twist. Providing the audience with information whenever you can, unless the surprise is a twist. So, first part here in this quote um, is that Hitchcock obviously is of the opinion that spoilers aren't really a problem when it comes to suspense. Quite the contrary, his understanding of suspense, this very specific form of Hitchcockian suspense, cannot be spoiled because it relies on the fact that you, as a viewer, no more than the main character. Unless you're surprised with a twist. And of course, Hitchcock was not only the master of suspense, but also the master of the twist. And he's responsible for probably one of the most famous twists in uh, film history, uh, the end of Psycho. Uh, and again, this is something I think uh, Sebastian will talk about uh, today and also Milan Hein uh, when he talks about uh, trailers. There, is, there was, um, for Psycho, uh, a very famous advertising campaign. You can see it uh, here that uh, people were asked by the, the master himself not to give away the ending to other viewers. And also there was this thing that um, once uh, the film started, people weren't allowed to enter the cinema anymore. To be honest, I'm not really sure how serious Hitchcock really, really was about that, whether this is not at least partly just very clever marketing. And I'm not really sure, where, I, I've, I simply don't know whether this, this thing with the not end, let people enter the cinema, whether it was really, whether they really pursued that, uh, but it was something which uh, became quite famous. But we also have to say, um, realize Hitchcock was not really the first to do that. Yet just as an example, this is, from the tra trailer uh, of The Bad Seat from 1956. So here it says in the trailer, when you see it, we will appreciate you're not divulging its startling climax, climax, for you have never seen a picture like this before. So this is not entirely new. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that this is the early example in film. This is just an example I found. Uh, there is at least when it comes to theater, there are even early examples, famous example of Agatha Christie's The Mousetrap which opened in 1952, there also audience were asked not to give away the, the ending. Um, but uh, here, just uh, again, a remark, uh, trailers and spoilers, that's really an interesting subject. And again, Milan will talk about this uh, in panel uh, three today. Now, Hitchcock's concept of suspense is not the only uh, version of suspense, or you can also conceptualize suspense in other ways. Hitchcock's uh, concept of suspense, as we've seen, relies on the audience knowing more than the protagonist. And as, and as such, it is a, a very specific form of dramatic irony. Dramatic irony as a concept is very old. This goes really back to antiquity. So the idea that we as the as audience, the audience knows more than the uh, main protagonist. And you could argue that the classic tragedy is always worked with dramatic irony because it relies uh, on the fact that we as you will know that things will turn out bad. You cannot, I would argue, uh, and uh, this uh, I think is uh, confirmed by most uh, research, 
you cannot really argue a classic and you cannot really spoil a classic tragedy like Sophocles' Oedipus Rex because we know from the beginning how things will turn out. We know that Oedipus is responsible for the plague in Thebes. We know that he killed his father and so on. Okay, Oedipus doesn't die in the end. He just gets his eye torn out, eyes torn out and has to wander the world. So he, he doesn't die, but we know that things will bad, end badly for him. But this is not something which can be spoiled. The, the whole point is that we watch the downfall of, uh, of this character. And this is not something that can be spoiled. But if we look at other forms of spoilers, and uh, not of spoilers, sorry, if we look at other variations of suspense, there's an interesting distinction made by Mary, Mary Law Ryan. Um, and I'm sure she's not the only one who makes this distinction between what and how or why suspense. So a suspense uh, which focuses on the, on the question what will happen and suspense on the question on how it will happen or why it, it happens. And there are, I already uh, said that before, there are many genres where the what is not really a question. You could argue that in the a classic tragedy, you know how things will turn out. Um, but I already mentioned this romantic comedy, there is also not really a question of what. Here are six examples of recent romantic comedies. And I have to confess, I haven't seen any of these films. I know none of them. Uh, I uh, came uh, this, I found these pictures by looking at the Wikipedia uh, entry on romantic comedies. And although I don't know any of these films, I can tell you in each case how they will end. And I'm sure you could do the same. And in some cases I could even, just by looking at the poster, I could uh, probably even give you a rough sketch uh, of the plot. And uh, that's not because I'm a, such a great scholar of film, because, uh, uh, but simply because we know how these stories work out. We know that in The Ugly Truth, Catherine Hegel and Tara Butler will end up together. Uh, we know that uh, Justin Timberlake and uh, Mila Kunis will uh, end up together uh, and so on. So here it's really not, if we talk about suspense here, the suspense is not what or why. The interesting thing is what happens uh, uh, on the way to the end. How will they get together? What obstacles will they have to overcome? What misunderstandings will develop? How uh, will they bicker with each other and so on? That's the interesting thing in this uh, kind of uh, a film. Also, I think there is a specific kind of suspense, which I'm not really sure whether a similar to this uh, kind of suspense exists in literature, probably it does, but not as um, distinct. That's the kind of suspense when you sit completely tense in the, in the cinema, when you grab your chair because you're so excited about what is going to happen. Mary uh, Law Ryan, she gives the example of what suspense of like this cliche in the Western when the heroine is tied to the railroad tracks and the railroad is approaching and you're not sure whether she will survive or not. So that for her is a classic example of uh, what suspense. But I would argue that in this case, the suspense does not really rely on the overall plot. It's not really important what will happen after the scene. It's, it's not even really important how the scene will, will end. It's really very much in the moment. Here are four examples of scenes which are generally regarded as uh, quite tense and exciting. And I would argue that each of, the, uh, um, of these examples and many others, the tension, the suspense does not arise from the bigger plot. We know that James Bond will survive, that he cannot die, again, until very recently, but still this scene is suspenseful, this, this scene is exciting. And you could probably also argue that in case of Blade Runner, you actually also know that uh, Rick Decker, the Harrison Ford character, cannot really die. You could probably make the argument that the other, other two examples that there is a chance that they uh, won't survive because you don't really know what the David Fincher is up to. And I think the Deer Hunt is especially interesting uh, for those of you who know the movie. This is for me one of the most tense scenes ever to be put on film. Uh, it's really a bodily experience. It's something you, 
you live through with your whole body because it's so nerve wracking. I remember very well when I saw it in person in the cinema, it, uh, it's, really, it's really a physical experience. But funny enough, when I uh, looked for the screenshot to, uh, to uh, add it to the, uh, my presentation, I realized I actually don't know how the scene ends. I've forgotten it. Or I really have to think, uh, who, does someone actually die? Who dies? I can't remember because it is not really important for the tension which builds during the scene. Um, this kind of suspense, if you actually want to call it suspense, does, I would argue, not rely on plot or a little, little on plot. It is something which has much more to do with staging, with timing, and uh, certainly not the least with acting. And how things will develop afterwards, overall plot is really not, uh, not really a, a big issue in, in this question. Uh, and here also, um, as a, a side note, um, the question of what kind of endings and structures can be spoiled uh, will also be a subject of uh, Matthias Brutsch talk uh, in panel three later today. One thing which I find particularly striking, and uh, I'm not sure whether you all agree, is that at least in my impression, the whole fear of spoilers is especially pronounced when it comes to uh, blockbusters, to huge franchises. Uh, and this is, at least to me, a bit uh, of a paradoxical situation, because you uh, could argue that we actually in the case of Star Wars or a Marvel movie, there's not that much to spoil either because we exactly know how these films work, especially uh, in a superhero movie, when it's the first movie for a, a new superhero, you know there will be an origin story, you know there will be a, a villain um, which has his own origin story, they will fight each other, and in the end, the superhero will win. We know that. So there's not really a lot to spoil here, but, Again, I would argue, or at least when I'm not an argument really, it's just an observation that it's really these kind of big franchises where the fear of spoiler is especially prominent. Or to put it another way, in my experience, art house movies are rarely the subject of, of, spoiler, of uh, spoiler panic or documentaries. Um, I haven't never, I don't think I've ever really seen a film review for a documentary with a spoiler alert. And that's not because you could not spoil the documentaries. There are, for example, um, uh, the, uh, many documentaries which cover up uh, a crime where um, all investigative documentaries, they, uh, they, always fo uh, they often follow a dramatic structure which is very similar to a kind of a mystery or a crime movie. And there you could also anti-spoiler also, this you could also spoil but still, you don't really uh, see that. And the reason I would argue why, why this is the case is that a certain kind of twist narratives is especially suited uh, for big franchises. And here we have to differentiate between different kinds of twists. There's the kind of twist in a movie like Sixth Sense or Usual Suspects or Fight Club, where you have a big twist in the end which turns everything around. Where you realize everything up to this point is not as it, as it seems, everything is different. It's a completely different world. The main character is actually dead or he's delusional or I don't know, uh, he lives, uh, he's just a, a brain in a jar or I don't know, but you have one big twist in the end, which changed everything. In these uh, modern franchises, you have many twists uh, along the way and twists of a very different kind, I would argue. For example, in the latest Star Wars movies, several character, characters die and get resurrected. Kylo Ren, Kylo Ren dies uh, and is resurrected. Princess Leia dies and resurrected. And, uh, and Luke, I don't know, is he dead or not? I don't know. And even if, if he is dead because he's now part of the force, he can still communicate uh, with the other characters. So um, there's something really uh, interesting going on that, uh, because uh, they all follow a twist structure, basically everything can be reversed. And I think the most prominent example occurs in the Avenger movies. Many of you, you have certainly seen it, uh, uh, Avengers Infinity War, 
there you have the super evil guy Thanos who succeeds in completing the Infinity Gauntlet, which gives him ultimate power and he snaps his fingers and terrible things ensue. So by snapping his finger, uh, he kills off half of the population of the universe and the film ends with Thanos with a big grin sitting there, he has succeeded. When I saw this movie in the cinema, I have to admit that moment was quite impressive. It, there was really an audible gasp in the cinema and you could feel everyone was like, they really did it. They actually uh, had the bad guy win. They had, they killed off half of the universe. But at the same time, I would say it still wasn't that uh, strong of a punch because we all knew there was another Avengers moving uh, coming next year. And, um, and people who uh, really paid attention to the plot, they realized that uh, Doctor Strange behaves in a certain way and, it, and that's for a reason. But even if you didn't look, uh, uh, if you didn't analyze it that uh, uh, thoroughly, it was actually quite clear it would not remain this way because there was an the movie coming up. And so one year later, we get Avengers Endgame and there, thanks to time travel and other plot shenanigans, uh, we now have Hulk, Bruce Banner, however, however you want to call it. He has now the Infinity Gauntlet and he reverses everything that has happened before. So in the world of the modern super franchise, nothing is really permanent. No one is really dead. Everything can be reversed. And so these, uh, uh, these twists have a really a, a different function. And here uh, I would argue that uh, this is in some way part of a, a part of a large trend because we can see over the over a longer period of time um, that there is at least in mainstream cinema in Hollywood cinema there is an increasing emphasis on plot. The Australian film critic Adrian Martin uh, writes in a polemical piece from 2018, he writes about the overvaluation of the script. Martin doesn't talk about spoilers at all. He talks about the rise of handbooks and how to books, how to write screenplays, how this is something which started in the late 70s and by the 80s uh, turned into a huge industry. You have dozens and dozens of books, how to write a screenplay, and you have uh, countless seminars and other stuff where you can learn how to write a screenplay. And he sees this as part of a part of a large, large development, which in the end uh, starts with the end of the studio system, where the, from, the, from then on, the screenwriter is not employed by the studio anymore. He's an independent writer. And therefore always has to come up with smarter, more ingenious screenplays. Uh, and also the screenwriter is often not really a part of the production anymore. And this, according to Martin, leads to a general emphasis uh, on screenplay. And as I said, it's a very polemical piece for Martin. This is really an impoverishment uh, of cinema because he says actually plot is really not that important. Uh, there are other aspects. Uh, aesthetics, uh, aesthetics uh, and acting and everything else, which is actually much more important for cinema. And you can agree with that or not, but I think what his, uh, his general di diagnosis that there is an increasing emphasis on plot is, is correct. And this increasing emphasis on plot ties in perfectly with Hollywood's current preference for huge franchises. Because these franchises, they are all cross-media franchises. Uh, they are not just uh, movies in the cinema or a streaming service. They are also seri uh, TV series. There are comic books. There are, I don't know, uh, games, happy meals, and so whatever. But all these things have to be connected somehow. So you need a kind of plot structure which allows you to connect all these kind of, of things. And ideally, if you actually have um, a multiverse, you can uh, add even more stuff uh, and you can uh, uh, do even more tie-ins. So, uh, so this is really something um, which is important just to keep the franchise together to make sure that all these things remain uh, connected. And I would argue that in these huge franchises that 
the twists really have a very different function than in these films we think of as the, like the prototypical examples of complex narrations where there is a one big uh, twist in the end. So uh, the, the twist here is not uh, the big climax which resolves everything, but they are rather a kind of breeze uh, which makes the which keeps the machinery running. They guarantee that every uh, film can have a, a sequel uh, that uh, you can add more and more uh, stuff uh, to that franchise. And they, in a way, they function more as a kind of dramaturgical, dramaturgical special effect, uh, which spies up the plot. And I want to end this presentation with a hypothesis, uh, which is rather broad, and I'm sure people will disagree with it, and I'm not even sure whether I completely buy it myself, but still, I, uh, I want to put this idea forward that if we look at the modern blockbuster, and by modern blockbuster, I mean something like, uh, I don't know, mid uh, 80s, uh, early 90s, um, the time when, uh, probably more early 90s, the time when CGI, digital visual effects, became important. For quite some time, uh, digital effects uh, and this uh, very uh, big uh, visual effects, they were an important part um, of Hollywood's offer. Um, they would wow the audience, they would awe us, and they would impress us, and they would be a reason for us to go to the cinema. Have you seen these dinosaurs? They move like, they, they look like real, and how they move, oh, you have to watch that. I would argue that this is not the case anymore. Of course, visual effects are still very important, and we expect a certain level of quality when we watch a big blockbuster. But I would say that in general, the visual effects have lost their ability to awe the audience. They are not, they cannot function as the main reason anymore why we want to watch a movie, because we all know everything is possible. It's just uh, to uh, simplify it a bit, it's just a question of how much money they, they, they put into it. So, because uh, these visual special effects have to some degree lost their appeal. Hollywood needs a new kind of special effect. And my argument or my hypothesis would be that what was once this, this uh, digital dinosaur, which was basically the, the single and only reason why you actually would watch Jurassic Park, because it's really not that great of a movie, but there are just uh, these dinosaurs in it, that this uh, visual special effect has been replaced today by this kind of plot special effect. This is now what makes this movie excite, what makes these movies exciting because all crazy stuff can happen and everything can change all the time. Uh, so we are in an age where uh, there's an increase in what I call dramaturgical fireworks. And there is what I'm calling in these big franchises a constant narrative pressure. It always has to be, it has to be, become more complicated and smarter and even more things has, has to be reversed. So there is a constant pressure on that these stories have to become more and more complicated and uh, that uh, more and more twists. And I would argue that the reason why many people are reacting so sensitive to spoilers is that they somehow feeling this pressure we, uh, that this is something which also has an effect on the audience. And it's not so much that it's actually really about spoiling uh, because uh, uh, we can't give away the ending, but we are, uh, we are in a like on a, also feel a constant pressure which uh, is uh, created by this trend. But this is something which we can discuss now. Thank you very much.